In this lesson, we are going to cover measuring sound, vibration, and acceleration using IEP devices. We're going to cover the basics of IEP measurements and how to configure a DACMEX task to read them. We're going to start out with a signal overview of what sound, vibration, and acceleration measurements look like. We're going to look at how to select the correct IEP sensor and the right DAC hardware to use, how to connect those signals together, and then finally we're going to validate a measurement using NIMAX. Since we experience sound and vibration through different senses, we may not think of them as closely related measurements, but they are. Sound and vibration are essentially oscillations in different media, and just like vibrations can create sound, acoustic waves traveling through the air can generate oscillations, or vibrations, in solid materials as well. Because the theory behind the two is correlated, measuring sound and vibration is also similar in nature. In most engineering contexts, like designing motors, propellers, or wheels, sound and vibration are considered bad, since they can negatively impact human experience of the product, or can cause unnecessary strain on the system, wasting energy and decreasing device lifetime. In other contexts, like designing music equipment, sound and vibration may be desirable, but within limited frequency ranges. Now let's take a look at some example applications of sound and vibration measurements and analysis. Some common areas of sound and vibration measurement and analysis are acoustic or vibration testing, audio testing, or machine monitoring. Acoustic testing is often involving the environmental noise in a space, whether that's the inside of a car, noise pollution as the result of a major highway or factory, or the acoustic characteristics of a room, like a concert or lecture hall. Audio measurements are often concerned with a flat frequency response and flow distortion, or particularly uh, distortion at octaves. Machine monitoring is concerned with maintaining machine lifetime by measuring vibrations coming off of the machine, performing frequency analysis, and characterizing that to whether the machine is in a good state or is potentially in need of upcoming repair. In general, all areas of sound and vibration analysis are concerned with performing some sort of frequency analysis on the acquired signals. Advanced time domain analysis can also be performed to further identify characteristics of the signal. While acceleration and vibration measurements capture the same physical phenomenon, the analysis is where they differ. Acceleration and vibration are both change in velocity with respect to time, acceleration is not necessarily periodic while vibration is. So, acceleration measurements are typically concerned with a time domain analysis, or the magnitude of the signal at a given time. Vibration measurements are concerned with the frequency domain response, so reducing or enhancing certain frequency components of the signal. Measuring acceleration is similar in practice to measuring vibration the difference is simply in processing and analysis. Note that displacement velocity and acceleration in the graph are all out of phase with each other. Next, we're going to talk about IEP-based sensors and the hardware that goes along with them and how to pick which ones you might need. IEP devices are based on piezoelectric sensors, so we're going to start there. Piezoelectric sensors rely on the electric property of quartz crystals. These crystals generate an electrical charge when they are strained. Electrodes transfer the charge from the crystals to an amplifier built into the IEP sensor. Accelerometers and microphones both measure oscillations, but in different media. 
Therefore, the theory of sound and vibration measurements and their necessary signal conditioning techniques are similar. The type of signal conditioning implemented for accelerometers and microphones depends on whether they have built-in amplifiers. Because the charge produced by an accelerometer is very small, the electrical signal produced by the sensor is susceptible to noise, and you must use sensitive electronics to amplify and condition the signal. Let's take a quick look at how piezoelectric accelerometers work. When exposed to vibration, the accelerometer generates an analog output signal that is proportional to the acceleration of the applied vibration. That's great. How do we know what that proportion is? Well, if you look at the diagram, you'll notice that the piezoelectric material is sandwiched underneath a seismic mass, which is held in place by a preload bolt. By knowing the loads applied by the bolt and the mass, we're able to calculate a mathematical relationship that gives us the proportion of the acceleration to the applied vibration. That small signal is then fed out to the amplifier, which then produces a signal large enough for you to read and acquire data from. So, what's the difference between an IEPE device and a piezoelectric sensor. IEPE stands for Integrated Electronic Piezoelectric. IEPE adds integrated signal conditioning, the charger voltage amplifier, to the piezoelectric device so you don't have to. IPE puts the amplifier close to the sensor, which helps provide better noise immunity and a more convenient package. IEPE sensors do require 4 to 20 milliamp current excitation to operate the amplifying circuitry inside them, while a strict piezoelectric sensor is passive. So what are some of the advantages of IEPE? They're simple and easy to use. All of the microelectronics are built in. The output of an IEPE device is a simple constant current output between 8 and 30 volts DC at a straight 2 milliamps. There are some limitations of IEPE. The operating range of most IEPE devices is at a maximum of 120 degrees centigrade. Some go up to 160 degrees centigrade, but 120 is the norm. Also, IEPE devices are of a fixed sensitivity. If you want to change the sensitivity of your device, you're going to have to buy a new sensor. Now that we've taken a look at what makes up a sound and vibration signal, and we've looked at the internals of an IEP devices, let's take a look at the IEP sensors as a whole. This is what you're actually going to see in your application. On the left, you'll see an accelerometer, which is used for measuring vibration or acceleration, and on the right, you'll see a microphone, which is used for sound. These are pretty self-explanatory. There is one thing to note. Although sensor-type microphones have low sensitivity levels, they're durable, and they're able to measure high amplitude pressure ranges. So while your noise floor level is going to be pretty high, it's suitable for shock or blast pressure measurement applications. Now let's talk about IEPE sensor requirements for NIDAC devices. Brand names do differ, so look for an IEPE compatible voltage output. Your IEPE device may have one of several connector types on it. Some of those common connectors are 7-pin LIMO, Microdot coaxial, subminiature B or SMB, or BNC. Whatever the connector is on your sensor, typically it's going to come with a cable terminating in BNC on the other end to connect to your measurement device, so you shouldn't need to worry about it. Just pop it in and twist it. IEP specifications look similar to the 4 to 20 milliamp sensor output, but they are not compatible. That's very important. Now let's talk about signal conditioning for your sound and vibration signal. First off, you're probably going to need some amplification. This increases your measurement resolution and improves your signal to noise ratio. IEP takes care of some of this for you. To use an IEP device, you're going to need current excitation. 
IAPE devices are active, so they require some form of energy put in to get a measurement out. AC coupling removes your DC offset and helps increase your resolution by taking advantage of the full input range of the device. Filtering is going to remove external high frequency noise. Typically this is stuff that's outside of your range of interest, unless possibly you're working in sound at very high frequencies. And as always, proper grounding helps eliminate noise from current flow between different ground potentials, also known as a ground loop. All of the signal conditioning we talked about on the last slide is pretty straightforward except for possibly DC offset and AC coupling. In IDAC hardware, specifically designed for IEP measurements, usually provides some sort of AC coupling. This connection removes a DC offset by making use of a DC blocking capacitor in series with the signal. This is important for IEPE devices because excitation current for IEPE creates a DC component or an offset for the signal reading. By enabling AC coupling, you can filter out the DC component and increase your measurement resolution. Next, we're going to talk about connecting your signals. We will look at the pinout of an IEPE DAC device and show you how to properly connect a signal. This one, to access your device pinout, open an IMAX, browse to the module of interest, right-click on it, and select Device Pinouts. As you can see, for the 9215, which is a typical IEPE device, we're using a BNC connector. All you have to do with a BNC connector is pop the, the connector on, twist it, and you're good to go. Most IEPE devices are going to use a pre-assembled cable that terminates in BNC, so wiring these up is not really going to be something that you're going to need to worry about. Let's talk quickly about terminal configuration with IAPE. This is just a quick discussion of grounding and what's going on in the devices. In short, leave it in pseudo differential and you're good to go. Quickly discussing the background of that, most DAC signals, if they're floating, the negative signal could float outside of the range of what a DAC device can accept, and that can cause unexpected measurements. To counteract that, we use something called differential mode. As you'll see, there is an external resistor applied to differential mode, and that resistor is typically going to be in the 1K range. That brings the voltage of AI negative within the common mode of the DAC device, allowing you to read both signals. For IEPE devices, we're using pseudo differential. All that does, as you can see in the bottom diagram, is it uses an internal resistor. Depending on the device, this will either be 50 ohm or 1 kilo ohm. Let's talk about troubleshooting IEP sensors. First, keep cables short and away from electromagnetic interference. That's pretty common sense. What do we mean by short? Well, long cables can affect frequency response by filtering out high frequencies. So a common problem area might be if you're trying to read frequencies in the range of 10 kilohertz and you have a cable of over 100 feet long, things might not work out so well. Also, remember, IAPE requires excitation. If you're not getting the signal you expect, probably you forgot to activate that. I know it's simple, but it happens. Next, we're going to validate the measurement. I'm going to show you how to use NIMAX and DACMX sensor. All right, let's take a look at what this, look, this looks like in an actual task. So I've got NIMAX open, and we've got our 9234 selected. It's module 7 in our CDAC chassis. So I'm going to go over and right-click it. And just as a side note, if this were not an IEP device and everything were not BNC, we do have a device pinouts right here, and that will show you all of the pinouts on your device. IEP devices, like I said, typically B and C, you don't need to worry about it. So we're just going to go ahead and open a test panel. 
All right, now let's go about setting this up. We're going to select channel 0. That is one of the accelerometers in our demo box. The rate's fine. We're going to go to a continuous acquisition, so we can just watch things go. We're going to change the samples to read. We're going to divide that by 10, so the screen will update 10 times a second. We're measuring voltage. Voltage limits are fine. It's going to have to be pseudo-differential. And we want AC coupling, because with an IEP device you have an excitation voltage, and we want to remove that. And we're going to enable IEPE, because we're using an IEP device. All right, let's start the task. You'll see that the device is settling out, and we're now pretty close to zero volts. Now, if I come over and tap the device, you'll see that there were spikes on the recording when I hit the device, and um, that just gives us a reading off the accelerometer. If we were doing bigger movements, we could record continuously and have actual vibrations coming off of it, but in this case, we're just using kind of a, a punctuated quick tap. So then we can stop the device, and that's all there is to an IEPE task. Now let's do this in lab view. We're going to take a look at the properties that we set in NIMAX in the demo, and we're going to compare those to the DACMX Create Virtual Channel VI that you would use to do the same thing in lab view. In NIMAX, notice that our measurement type is a voltage. If you remember back, IEPE devices output voltages. In lab view, you'll note that we're using an accelerometer or microphone task. LabVIEW is doing the background work for you to convert from a voltage into the units of interest. Looking at the LabVIEW VI, you'll notice the only required input is the physical channel, which is the channel name in the test panel. You'll notice there's no IEPE enable setting on the VI. This is actually enabled by inputting a current excitation value and a current excitation source. Once you put those in, LabVIEW realizes, oh, I need IEP's excitation enabled, and it'll do it for you. Minimum and maximum values are the same by default. Units, you can use the context help to determine if you need to change this. Typically, you can use the default. And as far as the custom scales go, don't worry about those. To select AC or DC coupling, you're going to need to use a DACMX channel property node. If you drop one of these onto your DACMX task, you should see the settings that you see listed out on the slide. Now remember, DC coupling allows the DC offset from the excitation current to appear in the output signal. AC coupling removes the DC offset component. Now it's your turn. We're going to have you open and run an example program from the NI Example Finder, take a continuous acceleration measurement with the NI9234 and an accelerometer. In this exercise, you open the LabVIEW example IEPE Continuous Input VI and explore the block diagram. When configuring the DACMX Create Virtual Channel VI, you use the specifications for an accelerometer to determine what settings to put in. You also use information from the NI9234 manual to configure the channel. True or false? All IEP devices will work together. No need to check out the specifications. What is the velocity of a signal when the signal is at the maximum displacement?